All right, do you guys remember which trig functions were even, cosine, and secant? So what happened to the negative on those even functions? It just disappeared. So f of negative x is the same as just f of x. All right, and we didn't do that with the trig functions because you couldn't really do that with the trig functions. But what we're going to do is learn how to decide if a function is even or odd or neither uh, algebraically. And that is to just put negative x in for x. If you get the exact same function when you simplify it, it's even. So what happens when you raise a negative to the second power? It's positive. So a negative to any even power is positive. And so we put negative x in for x, simplified it down, and we got the exact same thing. So that means that was an even function. <clears throat> right it's possible that you may have to look at a graph and determine if it's even odd or neither i don't know but i'm going to show you how to do that just in case so i graphed that function uh, x squared minus three and all even functions are symmetric about the y-axis so y-axis symmetry is pretty easy to see it just the y-axis just cuts it in half and it's pretty easy, right? You might also be able, might have to look at a table of values. This is that same function and determine if it's even. And so on the table, like this point right here, three, six is on the table. And then if this is an even function, negative three, six should also be in the table. So if a, b, is in the table negative a b should be all right so that's three ways that we can decide if a function is even so let's talk about odd Okay, so the odd functions, there's a lot more trig functions that were odd. Well, not more, there's two more. So um, the sine and the tangent and the cosecant and the cotangent were all odd functions. So what happened to the negative on those? It came out in the front. So f of negative x is the same as the opposite of f of x. So in, on an odd function, <clears throat> every sign is going to change in the whole problem. So we're still going to put negative x in for x. So what happens when you raise a negative to an odd power? Negative. So negative x cubed is negative x cubed. <laughs> All right, and then negative 3 times negative x is plus 3x. So every sign is opposite. That means this is an odd function. Okay. And there's lots of functions that are neither. Um, being odd and being even is actually like a special thing that some functions are, but tons of functions are neither. Okay, so on example one, we're going to determine if the function is even, odd, neither, and we're going to really do four different things. So we're going to do algebraically. We're just, on B, we're just going to do from memorization, and then graphically, and then using the table. All right, so on A, we're going to just put negative x in for x. So that should be negative x to the fifth minus x to the third. And then the minus one can't change. There's no variable there. So what do y'all think? Even, odd, or neither? Neither. 
So because some signs changed and one sign didn't change, it's neither. It's not a special function. It's just a regular function. <clears throat> what about tangent of x? Even or odd? <coughs> odd. Okay. <clears throat> All right, let's look at C. So if we're looking at a graph, we can just do it using symmetry. Do you think this is even or odd? Even. even. Is it symmetric with the y-axis? Yes, if you fold it on the y-axis, it folds right on top of itself. What is that the graph of? Which trig function? I love it when you guys remember things. So you can also, if you recognize that is cosine of x, cosine of x is even, so it's even for many, many reasons. All right, what about D? This one's going to be odd. So if I, if I took this, and I changed both signs, it would give me this. Oh, there's one more thing about odd I didn't tell you all. Um, oh, I didn't. Oh, I left out this whole part. Sorry. <laughs> you didn't know about that last one. All right, let's go back and fill it in. I'm, it's not a great lesson for me to go out on. All right, so we, if we're determining if a function is odd using symmetry, it's symmetric about the origin. And that's not the kind of symmetry you're used to. So if I look at this point right here on that graph, that's the graph of x cubed minus 3x. Um, that ordered pair to me looks like it's the point 1, sorry, negative 1, 2. What do you guys think about that one? One negative 2. And that's what happens with the ordered pairs on odd or on symmetric about the origin, both signs change. So if A, B is in the table, then negative A, negative B is two. All right, and most odd functions go through the origin. There, there is a situation where, like, you could have um, a function like this. That is an odd function that doesn't go through the origin. But if z, if there is a point at zero, it has to be paired with zero. So zero must be paired with zero. All right, let's go back and look at D again. Okay, so zero is paired with zero. So that takes care of that condition. And then if we take these and do opposites, we get this. If we take this one and do opposites, we get this. So this is definitely odd. All right, and then the last thing we're gonna talk about um, is kind of comparing what increasing and uh, the increasing parts of a function is to when the function is positive because a lot of people kind of get those words think that they mean the same thing but they don't so we did increasing and decreasing back i don't know like september or august do you guys remember what it means when a function is increasing it's going up from left to right very good so the graph is rising from left to right. So it could be a straight line or it could be like a, a rounded line. If you were walking on it from left to right though, you'd be going uphill. <clears throat> now, when a graph is positive, uh, it has nothing to do with 
know, rising or falling, it has to do with where it's located. So uh, if a graph is a graph is going to be positive when graphed above the x axis. So it's all about location when you're talking about positive and negative. Okay, and then decreasing and negative are going to kind of be similar situations. So when a function is decreasing, the graph is falling from left to right. And then a graph is going to be negative when graphed below the x-axis. So we are going to just draw this random graph in that big space below. We don't need all that room. Okay. And this x-intercept that is over on the left, I'm going to call A. And then the x value that kind of lines up with the minimum, I'm going to call B. And the right x intercept, I'm going to call C. All right. Now we're going to do all the different things. So we're going to start with the interval where the function is increasing. And so we're looking to see where, from left to right, you're rising. So what x value does the function start increasing at b? And it's going to be increasing forever to the right. So what number is forever to the right? Infinity. All right, and then the, the new stuff for today that I don't think we talked about the first time we talked about this was positive and negative. So this function is positive when it's graphed <coughs> above the x-axis. So those are the intervals where the function is positive. So when it starts being a function at negative infinity, uh, it is above the x-axis. And what x value does it stop being positive? A, good. And then we do the U, and we start back up at C, and positive all the way to infinity. All right, and then decreasing. So we're talking about going uphill or downhill. So from the beginning of the function, which is at negative infinity, uh, the function is decreasing until you get to B. All right, and then this whoop, is where the function is negative. So between what two values? A and C, there you go. Okay, I'm gonna let you guys do example two on your own. Um, I do wanna, we're not using A, B, and C on this one. Some people got kind of confused. So we need to actually know where that is. And so if we're just going by ones, let's say we're just going by ones, so that's going to be two. That little maximum point is at three, and then the other x-intercept is at four. So those are the numbers you're going to use. So you're going to find intervals of increasing, decreasing, 
positive and negative. So when you're finished, just double check with mine. What questions do you all have? Okay, then the last one is a good review of stuff we did even before unit one. So like at the beginning of the year, we did like this pre-unit with equations and inequalities to solve. Um, so that's what we're going to use that old stuff to do this problem. So we want to know the intervals when this function is positive. So if you're comparing something to zero and it's positive, how would you describe it compared to zero? I may have said that really weird. Greater than zero. Good. So we're going to have to remember how to solve a quadratic inequality. There's lots of steps. The first step to find when this is greater than zero is to find when it equals zero. And so we would factor it and find what numbers make this equal to zero. Which is going to be negative two and four. And we're going to label those on a number line. Now we would put open or closed circles at negative 2 and 4. Open. So we're not going to include the numbers um, because that's where they're equal to 0. And that's not where they're positive. All right. So now we're going to test a point in each region. Now, zero is always the easiest. So if zero is not one of your, your values, then we definitely want to put zero in. And we would always go back to the original. So if I put zero in, what am I going to get? negative 8. So this is where um, that function is negative. So everything between negative 2 and 4 is going to be negative. Now the other regions we don't know until we try numbers. So I would recommend that that negative 3 you don't plug it into the original. That you plug it into the factored form. And we didn't do this a lot. We might not have done this at all. In calculus, we do this a ton. So, because in calculus, there's a lot of times you don't use a calculator at all. So we put negative three here. What are we going to get? Negative one. And then we're going to multiply that by what we put, what we get when we put negative three here, which is negative seven. So that's a positive seven or just positive. So everything to the right of negative two is going to give us a positive. All right, and we would do the same thing for 4. We would put 4 here. I'm sorry, it can't be 4. I got super confused. 
they would need to be on the right side of four, which would be five. All right, so we would put five here and we're gonna get seven. And we put five here, we're gonna get one. So everything to the right of four is positive. So how can I describe like all of this is a solution region and all of this is a solution region? How can you describe that? Do I remember doing that a little bit? Okay, good. All right, so you have one last stamp. In some, oh, maybe 